And there was a husband who was concerned about his wife's hearing, that she wasn't hearing well. So he called the doctor and he, he said, I don't want to have to bring her in yet. He, he said, but I'm concerned about her hearing. And the doctor says, I got a little home test that'll help you out before you even have to come into the office. He said, so talk to her from about 40 feet away. Just say something in a normal voice and see if she answers. If she doesn't, go to about 30 feet away and say the same thing and see if she answers. And if she doesn't respond, go to 20 feet and so on. And that'll be a good hearing test. And then you can come see me. So the husband the next day, she's in the kitchen preparing dinner. And so from the other room, he says, honey, what's from din for dinner? He figured he was about 40 feet away, nothing. So he goes, kind of gets out of his chair, goes a little bit closer, and he says, honey, what's for dinner? No answer. So he goes a little bit closer, 20 feet away. Honey, what's for dinner? 10 feet, honey, what's for dinner? Nothing. So he gets right up to her and he said, honey, what's for dinner? For the fifth time, Ralph, it's chicken. <laughs> Wrong person with the hearing trouble. <laughs> so there was a man that said, told his friends, uh, my wife gives me sound advice, 99% sound, 1% advice. <laughs> Not so with me. So um, in case you've missed any of our previous services or you were here and asleep, we were talking about what a wonderful wife and mother I am. <laughs> I would recap that for y'all, but you already know. <laughs> In all honesty, speaking on parenting is daunting and scary. If I'm being perfectly candid with y'all, I um, am the least confident about parenting right now because our children are at an age they've never been before. Think <laughs> Their adults are approaching adulthood and it's a whole different territory. And so my confidence level, thank God, isn't about me. It needs to be in the Lord. So that's what we're talking about. We need his help and his guidance and his grace over it all. Amen. If you'll remember from last week, the, what led to this verse, what I felt like led to this verse um, was, was sparked. It was um, hearing about an American Idol contestant of previous years, precious young man who shared about, he's recently written a song and he shared about his coming out with a different lifestyle, his fear of what the church would think, his fear of what his mother would think, his fear, and um, of course, he, he grew up Mormon, and they were, he was asked to leave the church, but his mother embraced him, and his mother um, loved him, and which is wonderful, and that's what's supposed to happen. We love our children no matter what, correct? We love and accept them. But she took it a step a little bit too far by saying, well, if your lifestyle sends you to hell, then we'll go to hell together. And um, just the heaviness of that, that as a mom, that that uh, is not what we're supposed to do. We can, we can love our children while disagreeing with what they may believe and still love and guide them. And so that's what sparked it. But will you all stand with me, please, for the reading of the word this morning? And it's out of Deuteronomy chapter 6 in the New King James Version. Deuteronomy chapter 6, beginning in verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and you shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and you shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you that it is our guide. And we thank you for blessing it. We thank you for the truths in it, the anointing upon it. And we pray, Father, that our hearts will be anointed to receive, our ears anointed to hear on your already anointed word. Thank you just so much, Father, for speaking to each heart this morning as you desire. In Jesus, your precious name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Keep this verse in mind throughout the message as the imperatives in it are the foundation of the message. We'll refer to verses a handful of verses, and we will call them our doorpost verses. As, as you recall, the latter part of those verses, it talked about doorposts in your house. In verse 7, it says, you shall teach them how? Diligently. To who? 
to your children. So we want to keep that in mind. Um, all the verses we use today will be out of the New King James, if you're following along in your Bible or on your phone. Um, I love the different translations of the Bible. So there's a verse in the Message Bible that says, Mama, I'm hungry. In the Amplified, it says, Mummy, I'm hungry, famished, starved. In the NIV, it says, Mother, I am hungry. And in the King James Version, it says, Henceforth, let it be known unto thee, birth giver, that my belly consists of emptiness. <laughs> yeah. So whatever y'all's favorite translation is, I don't know, but we're using New King James this morning. So just a quick recap, we had paralleled our parenting of our children in America, in our modern culture, in this modern world, with Daniel's upbringing in Babylon. And just a really quick recap, in the days of Daniel, Judah had fallen into idolatry, moral apostasy, which led them to being taken captive by the Babylonians. Babylon was known as one of the most wicked cities of its day. It was pagan. We spend a little bit of time paralleling Babylon with modern America. In the wicked city, they demanded bow knee to the idols. And in that city and in that pagan culture and in that wickedness and ungodliness, there was a standout young man. And what was his name? His name was Daniel. And Daniel was honorable and refused to bow. Daniel knew truth. Daniel knew what sin was. Daniel knew who sin was against. And Daniel knew his convictions to not go against his God. Although it doesn't state it directly in Daniel, we can deduct that Daniel's upbringing was done very well and was taken seriously because he was well prepared for the ungodly world he was about to be put into. Daniel had standout characteristics and traits, virtues that were foundational to his ability to lead a godly life in the Babylonian world. We had discussed that Daniel had two things last week, conviction and integrity. Unwavering conviction, conviction notable integrity. Today we'll add to those virtues humility and wisdom. Daniel had humility. In the very first chapter of Daniel, in verses 8 through 16, he has declined the king's delicacies, but he does, it, does not do it in such a way that he makes demands upon it. He does it very humbly and very honorably. And, he does, and the, those, those verses there, 8 through 16, show us that Daniel didn't just bust in the door and said, hey, I can't eat this junk and I'm not going to eat this junk and y'all can't make me do it. He did it very honorably, which reflected that Daniel had humility about it. He was gracious in, in his methods. Daniel's humble approach in part is what helped him to thrive and find favor with the king. Humility is a critical virtue for success, success that is accompanied by not just success. So we think of success as success. Um, when we talk about Daniel's success, it was his success with the kings, with his favor he found with the kings. But in his success, he maintained inner joy, and he maintained inner peace, and he maintained constancy, and he maintained his convictions. That is true success. He maintained his sense of purpose. Why is humility so important in our world at any time? To be teachable, one must be humble. To be faithful and loyal, one must have humility. To be patient and to forgive, one must have humility. To work hard, you need humility. To own one's own mistakes and not be owned by them, what do we need? Humility. Daniel could easily, he could have easily been prideful in his upbringing, in his privilege. And he could have easily been resentful in his captivity. Yeah, he was humble in both. He was humble in his privilege and he was humble in his challenge. In the both, he remained humble. What a wonderful picture that is for us. One of the things that Daniel's humility instilled in him was the ability to know to serve. He had a servant's heart. He served loyally and faithfully under Nebuchadnezzar, Belshazzar, Darius, and Cyrus. And he had favor with all four of them. He served each honorably without compromising his own beliefs. His humility is what brought him into favor. Just as the ones who raised Daniel, so it is upon us to instruct and lead by example. Everybody say with me, by example. Our children in walking in service to others. In a culture obsessed with who? Self. 
We need to raise children who have a humility that compels them to prefer others, that drives them forth in service to others. We see our photo display of Daniel's humility in Daniel 2.24. Um, when, when the king, okay, so the king is killing all the wise men that can't interpret his dreams. We can't t read all of Daniel. That would take forever. But he, the king has dreams, and he wants them interpreted. And his wise men can't do it. And so he's killing them. He's having them killed. Y'all remember the story? Um, if I were one of his wise men, I would have been making it up. It's, your dream means you will be the most wonderful, handsome, amazing, rich king that was ever. They needed AI, didn't they, Taylor? They needed AI <laughs> to help interpret the king's So he's killing them. And in verse 24, Daniel says, don't kill them. I'll, I have the interpretation. Daniel could have easily just said, oh, sorry. But he said, don't kill them. He was thinking of the wise men. I'm sure he was watching one next to another drop. And he said, don't kill them. I have the interpretation. True humility not only serves, but is marked by empathy and compassion. Empathy and compassion. This has to be modeled in front of our children. Y'all remember the famous humanitarian Mother Teresa, the Catholic nun who lived most of her life in um, Calcutta in the, with the poorest of the poor, the dirtiest of the dirty, the sickest of the sick. And she devoted her life to that. She had some extreme beliefs, but she certainly was a model of humility and servanthood. Her quote is this, humility is the mother of all virtues. It is in being humble that our love becomes real, devoted, and ardent. Will you turn with me to Philippians? This is a doorpost verse. So if you're writing it down, this is one of our doorpost verses to have in our homes, to teach to our children, to live in front of them. Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 through 8. Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 through 8. It says, let, there had been some, I believe that what led into this verse was some infighting in the church and some problems. And so but we, we can take the, this verse and apply it to all areas of our life, though. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look and not only for his own interests, but also for what? The interests of others. Who is the model? Verse 5 tells us, Let this mind be in you, which was also in who? Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery, robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, coming in the likeness of men, and being found in the appearance of a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to what point? To the point of death on the cross. The per what a powerful verse that to teach our children, to sh live before our children. Humility recognizes its need for God. In his humility, Daniel recognized his utter dependence on God. He did not rely on his education, although he had a good one. He did not rely on his position, which he had a, a favor with the kings. He did not rely on his gifting to interpret dreams. Daniel relied on who? He relied on God. How do we know that? Let's turn to Daniel 2.20. And it just says it um, better than I could. Daniel 2.20. Of course, the Bible can say it better than any of us could. So Daniel blessed the God of heaven, and Daniel answered and said, these whole section of verses, blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his, and he changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and he raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and secret things, and he knows what is in the darkness, and light dwells with him. I thank you and praise you, O God of my fathers. You have given me wisdom and might and have made known to me, to me what we asked for. For you had made known to us the king's demand. Who did Daniel know everything came from? He knew it all came from God, nothing from his own abilities, nothing from his own um, upbringing. It came from God and he knew and he recognized that. At the earliest of ages, we are to point our children to Jesus in their need, in their joy, in their discontentedness, in their sin, in all areas that we're to point them to where? 
We point them to God. Someone pointed Daniel in his upbringing to God. Daniel didn't see himself above others. He saw himself beneath the hand of God. Humility made Daniel one who did not boast and who did not brag. It was reflected that he was not braggadocious, although he could have been. Makes me think of a story of two men who were bragging with one another. And one of them says, well, I don't mean to brag, but my psychologist says I have the biggest ego he's ever seen. (laughs) And his friend says, well, I don't mean to brag either, but my financial skills are so amazing that my bank calls me every day and tells me my debt is outstanding. (laughs) Sounds like some people we might know. Does anyone besides me roll their out rise at the showboating and professional sports? Am I the only one? Oh, thank you. (laughs) Robert has said, act like you've been there before. If you get paid millions of dollars to bounce, throw, catch, run with, hit, kick, a ball, how much do they get paid? Millions of dollars. When you cross that little goal line and make a touchdown, act like you've been there before, right? I'm all for celebration, but some of it is so indulgent and so boastful. And I know I love football too, but sometimes when that nonsense goes on, I'm just grumbling about it. Because that does not reflect God, does it? There's no humility in it, especially if you get paid that much to do it. No showboating. Daniel wasn't a showboater. He didn't brag on himself. We need to teach our children to be humble, even in what they're good at even in their gifting. Daniel was undeniably gifted. In verse 4 of Daniel chapter 1, it says he had no blemish. He was good looking. He was gifted. He possessed knowledge, and he was quick to understand. That's a pretty good list of stuff, isn't it? But he wasn't boastful. Daniel knew not to boast because his gifting was from God, and he used it humbly to serve God. Humility makes us pliable and workable for God to use us. Y'all remember Corey Ten Boom, the Dutch Christian whose, um, whose family most of who died in the Holocaust. She was a survivor. She saw her sister tortured by Nazi soldiers. She saw her dad die in, the, in the, one of the camps. Just atrocities, absolute atrocities. Well, she spent a better part of her life talking of this and she wrote the book the, called The Hiding Place. And she spent 33 years of her life traveling around the world, 64 different countries, speaking on her experience and talking about the Lord, talking about God. Someone once asked Corey Tim Boom how she could possibly handle all the accolades and all the recognition and all the praise and all the compliments that she received. And this is her response. She said, I looked at each compliment as a beautiful long-stemmed rose given to me. I smelled it for a moment and then I put it in a vase with all the other roses. Each night before retiring to sleep, I took the beautiful bouquet and I handed it over to God saying, thank you Lord for letting me smell the flowers. They all belong to you. A woman who went through pain that we don't, most of us couldn't begin to understand and saw the, 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 the raw ugliness of humanity inflicted on her own loved ones. And what was she? Humble in it all. She didn't receive the compliments as her own. She received the compliments and she gave them to the Lord and said, they're yours anyway. And she thanked him for them. Another famous quote by Corey Tim Boom, nothing sets a person so far out of the devil's grasp as humility. True humility is rooted in a sense of worth. Humility will be more easily taught to our children when they know that their worth is in God and that he loves them. Mother Teresa said, if you are humble, nothing will touch you, neither praise nor disgrace because you know whose you are. Isn't that powerful? 
Oh, you want to know what a humility killer is? Indulgence. Okay, y'all prepare. I'm about to step on my toes, your toes, the world's toes. Our children are overindulged. They are overindulged and they are more discontented now than ever before. We have birthday parties that are bigger than weddings of a few years ago. I'm guilty. I am stepping on my own toes. Brian, will you bring that little basket up to me? Now, those of you who have seen me talk about this before, you just hush your mouth because I can hear you rolling your eyes. Long, long ago in a land far, far away, there was a little girl named Shishi. That's me. And on her seventh birthday in Demi, New Mexico, she had a birthday party that her parents always forgot, as she did all five of our birthdays <laughs> and our dad. But when they remembered, like, oh, no, it's your birthday. So when they, by the time they remembered it was my birthday, we said, well, we're going to, everything was closed, except for Kip's big boy. Y'all remember those? Big boy. And so the way he always took us out. Once they remembered our birthday, they took us out to eat, and everything was closed, so they took me to the grocery store, to the toy aisle. And I got him. 50 years later, I still have Luther. His little card said Luther. As a child, I got confused and I would call him Lucifer. <laughs> and then one day someone corrected me. I'm like, oh, <laughs> well, I didn't know any better. Of all my upbringing, what do I still have? I still have Lucifer. I still have Luther. A memory, if we, in today's world, took our children to the grocery store for a toy, that, that would be, oh, what, you forgot, and we, all the hoopla that we're supposed to. Is anyone else guilty besides me? Yes. Indulgence is a humility killer. Because indulgence breeds a mindset that is not healthy and does not promote humility. I've got to hurry. The other thing I kept from childhood, you probably can't see it, was my Snoopy watch. I changed the band to make it look more fancy, but it's a Snoopy watch. Fourth grade. I remember getting it. I was in fourth grade. And the other thing that I have <clears throat> is the Bible that I received when you graduate at the Methodist church or whatever, and I think it was around seventh, second grade. And... I have the, my Bible signed by Pastor St um, Sperling. I always I want to say Sterling, but it's Sperling. I remember sitting in the, they didn't have kids' church then. I remember sitting and flipping through it and looking at the same pictures over and over and over and knowing that God was in it. Not understanding, but knowing. When we indulge our children, overindulge them, we are handicapping them from developing humble hearts. We are at causing them to be more discontented. And I'll be the first to say I love to make my children happy. I love for them to have, have things. Lord knows we've spent enough money. <laughs> Brian loves to see them happy. We love that. But indulgence, just remember, overindulgence is a humility squelcher. So can y'all join with me in making a commitment to telling our children, y'all don't get any more stuff? <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. We're not going to do that. Daniel had wisdom. Everybody say wisdom. To raise godly children in an ungodly world, we must impart wisdom. The thing is, wisdom is hard to impart, isn't it? Wisdom is more appropriately, it's gained. Wisdom is gained. It's difficult to teach wisdom, but we can do things that help our children to gain wisdom. And I'll tell you in a minute how to do that. But can we first get this settled? Would you agree with me that just plain old common sense, much less wisdom, is becoming more and more rare? Yes. It's just like, does anybody, you can, just driving, you experience it. Much less in, in what we see on, on media, what we see in television, what we see as forms of entertainment. I watched a video of a lady at a salon and sweet girl, and she meant well, I'm sure, but they sh she would show where she would see, people would sit in her chair to have their hair done, and she would step back and say, do I have permission to touch you? Oh, how are you going to cut their hair or wash it or brush it if it's not touched? And we have allowed that to become the norm in our world where we're just silly. Everybody say silly. silly. <laughs> just silly stuff. 
just nonsense, silly stuff. We could go through a long list of things like that that is just nonsensical, almost idiocy in our culture. How and when did it all go so wrong? We have a doorpost versed in Proverbs chapter 9 and verse 10. Proverbs 9, 10 through 12. Where did it go wrong? Well, let's look at this first. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. For by me your days will be multiplied and years of life will be added to you. If you are wise, you are wise for yourself. And if you scoff, you will bear it alone. Go back to verse 10. What is the beginning of wisdom? The fear of who? The fear of the Lord. This verse plainly tells where wisdom begins. It begins in the fear of the Lord, right? Deductive reasoning would tell us where folly begins. Where does the folly of the world begin? In the lack of reverence, reverential fear of the Lord. Does that make sense? That only makes perfect sense. So why is the world so off its nut? Why has the world's cheese slid off the cracker? Why has someone blown out the pilot light? Why? Because like Judah in Daniel's time, our attempt to push God off to the sidelines and to ignore the reverential fear of the Lord, in that we have become foolish. Would you all agree? And our children are living in this very foolish world. Long, long ago, there was a verse... God led me to as we embarked on parenting. Those of you who've known me long enough can say it along with me. Don't laugh at me because I say it all the time. Foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child and the rod of correction will drive it far from them. Proverbs 22, 15. What's in the heart of a child? Foolishness. How is it in the heart of the child? Bound up. What is implemented by God's standards to deal with the foolishness? Correction or discipline. That doesn't mean just spanking. It's all kinds of discipline, loving discipline, correct discipline. And what will that discipline do? Drive it. Those are powerful words. Drive it. Drive it where? Far from them. What a simple, powerful verse to live by. Here are the questions. Why does God require the discipline of our children? To drive out what? Foolishness. When should we begin to implement discipline? Whenever foolishness starts raising its cute little head, drive it out. What should the heart of discipline be? Fear of the Lord and love for our children. What is the result of raising children in reverential fear of the Lord? Wisdom. How did Daniel survive and thrive as a godly man, young man in an ungodly world? Through wisdom rooted in his reverence for the Lord. Who taught that to him? His parents. There we go. We just solved the world's problems. We can go home now. It's fixed. Everything's better now. It's all fixed, right? Many of us in this room would readily admit that the time we have with our children passes in a blink before they're adults, does it not? It's just fast. We don't have time to piddle with their upbringing. We don't time. Um, I am thankful that I had Sarah's help with raising Allison, my niece Sarah. She and her cousin Allison, our daughter, are close in age. And every time I went to teach Allison something, for example, I said, Allie, mommy was thinking about maybe it's time I show you how you can shave your legs. And she said, Sarah already showed me. <laughs> and every time I would approach Allison with something, Sarah already taught. So I had a helper in, in upbringing of Allison. It was Sarah, right? didn't we, Brian? You didn't even. Yes. Well, thank goodness that Sarah left some of it to us. But I do want to recognize, I am going to say this without crying. We have... 
some young parents in this room that are excellent parents. And I want us to take a minute as a congregation to tell them we are proud of them, that they are in church and raising their children in church, that they're disciplining them at home and they're guiding them and showing them a way. Can y'all with a minute just with me, just give them a hand and thank God for them. Let me tell you right now, if you're parenting, you have the full support of this church. You, if you have grandchildren that are wayward, you, we are your cheerleaders. There is nothing more important to me than a child being brought up and shown the way and conquering. It is important, and we are not defeated by this world. We are not on the losing side. Thank you, young parents, for following God's way and doing the right thing. Daniel's identity was fully intact, and he knew to whom he belonged, and he knew the truth. Our children's identities are under attack and on an onslaught on a daily basis and with upon us to do something about it. Would you agree? It is upon us. If it's your nephew, it's your niece, your grandchild, your great grandchild, your son, your daughter, the neighbor next door. Daniel did not identify himself as a captive or as a slave. Daniel did not identify himself as with his privilege or his education. He did not identify as a victim in the plot to destroy him through the lion's den. He did not identify is the, the, the interpreter of dreams. We must assure our children of their true identity. They cannot identify as victims or casualties of circumstance. They cannot identify as depressed or anxious or disabled. They cannot identify solely by their ethnicity or their gender or their family upbringing. They cannot identify by their success nor by their failure, by their strengths nor their weaknesses, by their highs nor their lows. They cannot identify by what culture says as they are and what social media imparts to them. Our children are more than their education. They're more than their sports. They're more than their athletic abilities. They're more than their talents. They're more than their diagnosis. Amen. They're more than all of that. They are these sons and the daughters of the living God of the universe, the creator of heaven and earth. They were adopted through the blood of Jesus, the king of all kings and the Lord of all lords. They are living, breathing, resident choice of the Holy Spirit himself. They have God-given purpose and meaning for such a time as this. It is upon us as we go upon raising our children the way Daniel was raised to train. Are you listening? I'm speaking to me too. I'm speaking right now then today and in tomorrow we are to be raising elite warriors spiritual fighters who take it to the enemy of their soul and who refuse to bow on bended knee to any god other than jehovah god we are to invite god into our homes as the commander in chief and build an army that never knows retreat in jesus name let me tell you right now in Jesus' name, give the Lord honor and praise. Will you all stand with us, please? You may be like me and be real unsure of your parenting skills right now. You may have given it your all and have one that's not serving the Lord. You may have messed up. You may not have known the Lord when you raised your children. You may be confused. You may be going through difficulty that feel like handicaps you. It's never too late to impart prayer and a declaration of God's word. We are to go after our children's future just as aggressively as this world wants to undermine it. We are not to take steps of retreat. We are to take steps forward. If you are in a place and you're like, I've messed it up, or I've given it my all and my child doesn't even want to serve the Lord, they're just far from Him, don't give up. Do not give up. There is a man named Paul on the road to Damascus ready to kill some Christians and who seized his heart? The living God. The living God stopped him in his tracks. Our children may have a diagnosis, they may have a disability, they may have an addiction, they may have, I don't know what they have. They may have a trauma, and they may be perfectly fine. 
It doesn't matter. The living God of the universe, when they were born, He signed that birth certificate long before they ever came. And He said, my purpose and my plan forever and forever today and forever, amen. Amen. Those watching online, those here in this building, if you have children, grandchildren, whatever, we join arms with you and we declare that our children will walk godly lives in an ungodly world. In Jesus' name, amen.